Hi everyone, uh, Shiram, what is it that you're able to hear? I mean, rather see? Uh, the poster. Oh, the poster is still there. Oh, is it still that I'm unable to, uh, has the poster gone? No, it's still there. Yeah, it seems to be, yeah, got it. Yeah. Yeah, so. so great, uh, let's start up for those who are delayed, they can always have a look at the recording later. I hope I'm clearly visible to all of you. Yes, you are. Awesome. So uh, what we're going to discuss today is Web 3.0. But of course, before we start with that, it's very important for us to understand why do we even call it Web 3.0? Where did all of this really begin? So when we talk about Web 1.0, that was the first generation of the World Wide Web. Started off in the early 1990s. So if some of you used to use the web at that time, you may remember that almost all the websites were static, right? They were created by businesses and people like you and me would consume the content. But then Web 2.0, which came, brought in a lot of user-generated content, which basically meant things like social media content or blogs or reviews. All of that data is actually created by users and controlled and monetized by certain large organizations like Google and Meta, which, is, which was earlier called Facebook. So in fact, right now also, if you realize when we are having this discussion, the video of this is being streamed on YouTube. So automatically what we are doing is we are creating that content on YouTube. YouTube doesn't create its own content. So web 2.0 is all about user generated content. Now the real focus of web 3.0 is <clears throat> how is it that we can enable the content creators to actually monetize their content. So instead of allowing Google and Facebook to make all the money from our content, is there any way in which we can control and create and monetize our own content. That's the fundamental logic. And it is based primarily on the technology of blockchain. Would some of you like to mention your point of view on that? Do you think this makes sense, this way of thinking? That let's put users in charge of their own content and let them monetize it. Does that make sense to you guys? Please feel free to yeah, unmute you yourself and share your opinion on that. I can tell that the monopoly will go because uh, we will be not be dependent on their algorithm. That's the more uh, important aspect of things. Okay. So. What about anyone else? Would anyone else like to contribute their thought on this? Okay. So when we talk about Web 3.0, the kind of applications that we are talking about, firstly is blockchain-based games. So as you may be aware that, you know, we have a lot of these play to earn games today. So in the normal conventional gaming industry, when you are playing a game and you are earning points, there is no way for you to actually monetize that, right? And as long as you're on a particular gaming platform, your points, lives, characters, guns, whatever you want are there. But when you go to a new platform, you don't really take any of this with you. Now, in a play to earn kind of, a, of an environment, we are basically talking about all these things being issued as NFTs or non-fungible tokens, right? So if I'm playing a particular game and I spend a lot of time and effort on that and I end up getting a lot of guns, each of these is an ERC-721 token or a non-fungible token. I can go to a marketplace and sell it to somebody else. Or I can then take it to another game also and maybe if the games are compatible, I can use it there. So that's the whole new revolution that is coming in with the blockchain-based games. And yes, somebody's pointed out, Ritu has said that misuse of user data will not happen. So yes, the chances of your data being misused in a web 3.0 environment ideally should be lesser. Then we have central bank digital currencies, which are likely to now start becoming very important. As you know, in India also, our government has announced that by next year, we will have central bank digital currencies, which would mean that you and I as normal citizens, instead of transacting through banks, we could directly transact through the central bank of our country. And all the money and all the ledgers and accounts would now be actually maintained by them rather than being maintained by the individual banks, which is what happens today. So even today we have electronic money. So when you look at your mobile phone apps and you have e-money balances in that, 
what is e-money? It is some data held in the private database of a bank, which is why every time that money has to move from one bank to another, it takes time and friction. But now imagine if everybody in India is having an account directly with the central bank, maybe through Aadhaar numbers, for example, and we are able to make transactions instantly with anybody else on the platform. So any Indian citizen would be able to pay any Indian in seconds. And not just cash, it could also extend to your other assets like real estate and gold and stock and everything could finally come to one particular platform. That's the vision of central bank digital currencies. And then between countries, you would have bridges. So each country's central bank could connect to other central banks and moving money globally also could happen within seconds. Any questions or any doubts on that particular concept? Yeah. Uh, hi, Ross. Gunjan here. I, I have one question. So in that CBDC part, basically a government will print the same amount of digital currency, which would be held in the market. That means it will be a total only. And take example, if they have to bring more monies into the market, which government have been doing right now by printing more currencies, this is how it's going to tag or is there anything different? Very good. Basically, yeah. Very good question. It's the same. The only difference is happening is that instead of coming to us through banks, it will come to us directly. But other than that, there is no restriction on how much money the government creates that they will create depending upon the needs of the economy. Okay. Okay. But that is at least publicly visible right now. Absolutely. We have, yeah, uh, because right now actually, we that's don't a, believe that's in a government. Good question. Yeah. It's, it, it may still not be publicly visible. It, uh, okay. Yeah. See, then... Because what we have to realize is it is not mandatory for the government to make those blockchain nodes open. So even if yeah. the government does decide to use blockchain to issue CBDC, it will not mm -hmm. be a public blockchain where everyone can see everything. Because then mm -hmm. everyone will be able to see everyone else's transaction. Uh, yeah, yeah. But so that, that again, transparency may not come. But that transparency yeah. is there. You can always make an RTI application to the RBI. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering. Anyone else? Then what is the use of uh, blockchain technology for CBDC if it is not open to public? That's a very I mean good to point. Say, that UPI is still is working in a similar manner. In seconds, you get the fund transferred within actually in India. But then why the CBDC? Sure. See, first of all, CBDC need not use blockchain, right? CBDC can be done without blockchain. So nobody knows for sure which country will use what. So some countries are using blockchain, some are not. Mm -hmm. So that's not mandatory. But the biggest difference is the way in which the money flows. Today, money is in private databases of banks. So if you have an account with A bank and I have it with B bank, only B bank knows my balance and only A bank knows your balance. Government doesn't know anything. And that is why when money has to move, if the bank has a glitch or it's on a holiday, sometimes money doesn't move. Now imagine all that money will be directly on a ledger controlled by the central bank of the country. That is the core difference. And now you will not need banks to disseminate this money. Citizens would directly deal with the central bank and money would move in that way. And as we can see, China is one of the countries that has really taken it live. Nigeria is another one. Some of the smaller countries are doing it. What changes is the equation. Rather than using it through banks, it's directly central bank to citizen. Hope that clarifies it. Yeah, that clarifies it. And uh, I think uh, just you mentioned that uh, it will be directly dealing with, public will be directly dealing with RBI. Uh, the bank's role will diminish in this case, right? So suppose in future, in 10 to 15 years, everybody will be using the CBDC. And now, like you said, uh, you see, after 2016, now everyone is using the Paytm and all the digital wallet. So 10 to 15 years uh, after, when the CBDC circulation will be like 70%, 80%, so what will be the use of all these banks? Excellent question. I've been saying this since 2015 that by 2030, I don't foresee banks being the way they are today. So I think by about in the next about seven, eight years, banks as we know them today will not exist. They would completely change and they would become more specialized NBFCs, where you would have some of them doing lending, some doing payment, some doing account aggregation. They are all, and, and if you look around you, you're beginning to see this change actually happening. Look at the number of different kinds of NBFCs that are getting licensed. All for specific vertical use cases. The concept of a horizontal bank doing so many different services is going away and specialized vertical based NBFCs are coming in. And I think we'll see everything going into that direction by 2030.
yeah it will be similar like uh, the verticalization is happening in e-commerce market you are absolutely right yeah. you are absolutely yeah. right actually yeah. any other questions okay in then CV, uh, yeah uh, rohas yeah. in cvdc the kyc updation would be required at opening the bank account right uh, well if it links to aadhar then it's automatic you don't really need to do anything specific your aadhar number automatically could become your cbdc number okay okay another thing is uh, what would be the speed of the transition would it be faster than upi uh no not necessarily it may still be a few seconds see upi is actually a kind of an outlier in the world hardly anywhere else in the world you have such a fast system yeah. so i am sure even a cbdc would be kind of the same speed it may be a few seconds more but otherwise no it won't be slow definitely and another thing is that in web 3.0 where there is a privacy something light of that at targeting with uh, will reduce right which targeting at at like facebook ads like google ads sure 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 so now what we have to remember in that whole thing is that today if we put our data on youtube do you realize youtube is spending the money to handle the data so gbs and tbs of data that we keep pushing in terms of videos we are not paying for it so we've got to also remember that if we don't want entities like youtube then are users like you and me ready to pay for every video that we upload are we ready to pay hundreds if not thousands of rupees so as long as people are not ready to pay the you're not going to do away with entities like google and facebook right so we have to see how this starts to evolve because today if private people if we decide to start holding our data who's going to pay for it so that's another issue that we need to keep in mind before the ads completely go away but in web 3.0 we are beginning to see a very new trend where you have something like the brave browser and they have their own crypto called bat and when you advertise through that platform there the third party doesn't keep much money and most of the advertising money now goes to the end user who's actually watching the ads so instead of facebook ads you have brave ads but you get paid for watching the ads so that's how the model is actually changing See, at the end of the day, somebody has to advertise. That's the way you're going to generate revenue. But now, we will get part of the money or a large chunk of the money, which today we don't get from Facebook and Google. I hope that like clarifies the, it. Like the end users will be incentivized, right? Yes, the end user will be incentivized to watch ads. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Any yeah. other questions? Uh, I, yeah, Ross. I have a question on Metaverse side. I think that would be a part of Web 3.0 only, right? I'm coming to Metaverse very shortly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then I will. Just, when sure. you read to that topic at the time, I will ask that question. Sure. Now, Ro uh, Ross, one, one one very basic question comes into the mind when we think about the Web 3.0 that every transaction, if user is creating or generating some content, like you just mentioned, that who is going to pay the transaction fee, right? Uh, and it is very expensive as, even as of now now solana and polygons are making it cheaper but as of now it's still normal consumer is is not willing to pay a single penny to use the internet now if we think about the whole we can say uh, the conception of uh, web3 is based on that blockchain and somebody has to pay now if we don't talk about google meta and other companies but if we talk about other companies who are providing the services for example alchemy is there or some somebody is providing the oracle so somebody some somebody needs money to provide this infrastructure and service and user is not willing to pay so that web3 this is this is disconnected still Uh, no I, i'll explain that that's an excellent point you raise see one thing we must remember in no case is data being stored on a blockchain anyway so when we talk about a blockchain for video streaming the video is never getting stored on blockchain correct blockchains correct. are not built to handle data they are built to handle yes. smart assets so what happens is the data is stored somewhere else which could mm -hmm. be ipfs interplanetary IPFS. file system or other cheaper mm -hmm. ways of storing blockchain only handles transactions so the payment and all that is handled at the blockchain mm -hmm. level and already we are beginning to see if you look at some of the web3 projects which are in the data storage field they have brought down the cost to about 1/10 of what an amazon today charges you so some of the projects like storage or you know filecoin and others even sia coin project they are bringing down the cost to maybe about 10% so no. but at the end of the day advertiser is still there and a classic mm -hmm. way to look at it is the bat model so what bat is saying is if you use my brave browser i will block all the trackers which are on the world mm -hmm. i can block all the ads also but if you volunteer to see the ads which are from people on my platform 
i will pay you about 60 70% of the ad revenue so now the user is incentivized to watch the ads and the ad revenue is coming in so somebody else takes care of that cost and the user instead of paying is actually earning money okay yeah. that, that 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 play to earn and watch to earn yeah. model is there but still like there are a certain application like for example there is a google map okay uh, if you think about the google map in web3 with a decentralized service which google is not providing some other other companies providing the map how would you visualize that kind of service in a decentralized manner where user is not willing to pay sure so like i said even in the brave browser model the user doesn't have to pay the user is getting paid so the logic is that today when you use google maps so google is obviously generating revenue at the back end that's how they are able to give you this service mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now if somebody else runs that service and they generate huge revenue they share part of the revenue with the user so tomorrow google could decide to do that google mm-hmm. could say i will share revenue with my users and that's kind of like a web3 anyway so it is okay. not that web3 needs google and facebook to shut down no mm-hmm. it needs google and facebook to change their models to share money with the consumer so it's our data we are actually resulting in the revenue for them as long as we get part of the revenue back it's web3 yeah so it boils down to uh, uh, incentivizing the user yeah. incentivizing it is not about the back end technology because everybody is talking about the decentralization when you talk about the web3 but if we if, if the, the the statement you just made it simply means that the now the user will be incentivizing absolutely. for their data and for their activity over the internet absolutely correct absolutely correct So for That's me, Web three is a world in which users get monetized. Users yeah. are monetizing their attention. Whether right. it uses blockchain or not, according to me, is not critical. Whether it is done by centralized entities or decentralized, not critical. Yes. The model changes. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Any other points? Okay. Uh, then another very important thing that we have in Web three is the concept of DAO or decentralized autonomous organization. And the logic is very simple. In today's world, we have companies. right in a company as a shareholder we vote once in a while and then directors are appointed but after that the directors run the company right and we don't really have much say in the day to day running of the company but in a dao environment or a decentralized autonomous organization we as part of that organization can vote in virtually every decision so a bunch of us get together form a dao money is put into a shared wallet for example and then every time we want to invest that money somewhere all the users get to vote so it is like a mutual fund but with you voting on every decision and i believe over time almost all corporates will move into the dao way of working so that the investor has more of a say and more transparency on what's happening every day right and if you look at it certain countries like in the us the state of wyoming they've already made a law that if you are a dao you can automatically register it as a company without filing any additional documentation it's a, like a one click thing that your dao's documentation become your company documentation and i believe that concept will pick up and over the next few years all companies will move to a dao system of functioning it's the same regular company it could be like a normal colgate still selling toothpaste but allowing their shareholders to have more say on a day to day basis but rohit don't you think uh... Uh, this will be very messy no it won't actually what happens is when you make a dao you obviously specify what are the things that you will take voting on and what you will not if it mm-hmm. is a very regular matter or a very complex matter which you mm-hmm. feel an average shareholder will not understand you can keep that out of the purview but there are mm-hmm. so many other things that as a normal investor we can do today when a company wants to take your permission during the year they have to call a special meeting right mm-hmm. a special general meeting now there is so much time that goes in that you send out a notice and it takes weeks now imagine it could be done in seconds whenever the company wants to take your approval for something you immediately get a ping on your app you just mm-hmm. see the issue and you press a button and your vote is done as the moment that's legally recognized companies won't need to do agms and sgms with such a big friction coming in so uh, that that being said dao is nothing but participation of all the stakeholder in the company which currently is happening via agm and all the things and yeah. e voting it is just making it faster much much faster yeah so 
today's world if you realize what is the speciality of upi like when i first opened a bank account we had physical checks and mm. if we were paying someone in another city it could take up to 3 weeks mm. today upi has brought that down to few seconds irrespective of where in india you are i can send you money in seconds now imagine if dao is able to bring this same thing to all corporate decisions so your corporate governance and everything can now become that fast virtually real time and mm-hmm. and look at more things suppose the company wants to raise money from existing shareholders because a new opportunity has arisen do you realize how much time it takes today to do that you would go to the sebi you would file document then you would mm-hmm. open it up the whole process of rights issues and all that it takes months all that can then start happening in virtually real time where the company can inform you which is what daos are doing today they inform you that we have this new business opportunity this is what's going to happen if you agree with it pay the money right now and give a vote and within minutes you are able to do a new business transaction imagine all companies being able to move at that speed so instead of talking about uh, uh, normally when we talk about the daos it simply says that every stakeholder every user will be participating and all those things but ultimately uh, like just you mentioned it will be much beneficial for the corporate governance and the corporate affairs not as per the end user or the sh- normal for example i am a shareholder in a company it won't be much helpful for me but for the corporate governance well, actually the- it it would be for you also because now you have more to say see ultimately the company runs because of your money right mm-hmm. now you will have more of a say which today you and i don't have as investors right mm-hmm. it gives us more say and that is why we are beginning to see so many daos which are becoming popular so let's take an example somebody wanted to bid for the us constitution original copy and mm-hmm. they wanted to participate in the auction so they told the whole world if you want to be part owner of this put the money into a dao and we will put a bid if the bid is accepted and we win it then this will happen if it is not then this will happen a lot of people put money in they made a bid but they lost the money but they lost the bid they didn't win mm-hmm. so then they told people okay we are returning the money to you people said no keep the money and let's look for other business opportunities right so it mm-hmm. democratizes investment to such a level where if you have a new business idea and you want to take it live you don't have to take months and years you could create a dao on the fly and do the business opportunity raise the funding have people contributing all within a matter of seconds so that okay. is the way i think it's going to completely change our world yeah yeah this use case uh, uh, seems pretty much a very okay for the normal people yeah. yeah sure no i understand normal people will not be able to contribute to a lot of complex business decisions yeah. but out of the normal people some will be there who will have domain expertise mm-hmm. so you know we're going to see how this is evolving but i think it can completely change the way corporates function today corporate works right anyone else has a problem uh, uh, do you mean that uh, there will be no need of uh, ipos in the future in future absolutely absolutely ipo will get replaced so you know instead of so in an initial public offering which we have in the conventional world there are a lot of terms and conditions it takes a lot of time all that would now become much faster it would probably have a new name right the concept is still the same you are raising funds but daos make everything much simpler because what happens is the worry which is always there when we talk about ipos is that what if the company runs away with the money or what if their business model is weak which is why we have merchant banks and we have sebi and so many people who try to protect but take an example of what happened after the ipo of uh, paytm did not did the share price fall a lot yeah did a lot of people lose money yes so then it suddenly makes you question that is today's system actually able to prevent all this no because we realize at the end of the day there is always an element of risk in investments so despite all these hurdles if the risk element is still so strong then why not daos where people are making more conscious decisions and a dao is set up for specific purposes a company formed once can run for 100 years it can keep changing its business model it can run forever daos are very specific so i as an ordinary investor would probably make it would make more sense to me to be part of multiple daos and invest my money into multiple business ventures mm-hmm. so it completely changes the way things will happen then in quarter result there will be complete transparency right i don't even think we would have quarter results we probably have real time yeah, results that's right? a, that's a, yeah. because again in dao if you are moving things onto blockchains all the transactions are happening on the chain 
so in real time anybody can see how much money is moving where this is the balance of my dow now a payment has been made here today as a shareholder you don't have access to the bank accounts of the company you are investing in right mm-hmm. but in a dow you have access to everything that's how things change and in a dow also we are running on smart contracts so you can see what is happening in our companies we don't really know what kind of decisions are being taken a lot of these decisions are never made public like what was the thought process behind a particular decision but in a smart contract world almost everything is visible to everyone Any and that's thoughts? why i said aros it might be very messy because a lot people the lot dimensions comes into the picture of a decision making the more messy it becomes which so i think uh, you have a good point there but you know what would also happen so let's say you are starting a dow and i know you are an expert in a particular subject i will then trust you so when mm-hmm. you say this is the decision i recommend this most of the people will agree because they trust you and they respect you so i don't think it will cause much of a mess because no, people in a similar manner think about it if some competitive uh, rivalry is there and because it will be open and the dow anybody can be, uh, anybody can be a member of it somebody might is uh, uh, come into your dow masking as a <laughs> representative agree, of agree agree those kind of, but see, all again, these kind of things again we have to remember in a dow decisions that don't have to be made 100% right mm-hmm. it can be 50% of the people and another thing in dow is very interesting is that suppose we say ours is a dow for bidding on collectibles right every mm-hmm. day new collectibles could come in and when they say today we are bidding on this very famous pen only those people who want to be part of that can say okay yes and their tokens get used to buy this it is not like every person in the dow needs to own every asset mm-hmm. so if you feel this particular business model or this particular auction you don't want to participate you stay away the other people do only their money gets used and then they get the benefits of that particular item which is bought so dows allow you to do this which is not possible in the conventional world in the conventional world a company does one thing all shareholders don't have a choice you mm-hmm. are part of the profit or part of the loss whatever yeah. decisions are taken Anjali but in a dow you can split that one minute oh, can i request everyone to mute one minute ready see i can hear some background noise yeah. so you know can you just check yeah so i'll move on to the next one the next is of course decentralized finance or defi which is like one of the most important things and we've seen it succeed so we are beginning to see insurance companies moving in there where you know you can have a policy which is completely automated you're catching a flight if your flight is going to be delayed you would automatically get paid so you go on to the blockchain click a few buttons buy the policy when your plane lands that data goes to the airport authority airport authority through an oracle passes it to the blockchain the smart contract immediately calculates who is to be paid and who is not to be paid because the flight was late or not late money is given to you you didn't even have to file a claim so we are beginning to see a lot of very interesting business models coming up in decentralized finance what i gave you as an example of insurance is just one we are beginning to see many different kinds of defi organizations coming out with all sorts of interesting models any questions on that so claim yeah, no, for no. yeah cl- yeah claim for remuneration would be also be easy for insurance companies right absolutely absolutely yeah. any other questions okay uh, yeah ros uh, now currently we see the whole scenario of defi uh, it is totally based on the uh, cryptocurrency and the tokens right mm-hmm. now if we merge this with the real world cases uh, still still there it need there is a gap which how do we tokenize everything every use case scenario sure. and th- there is a problem where when we say defi will prevail uh, we are not able to visualize the all the use cases properly map to the defi space sure so that's a very good point so that is why in fact my personal project which I, sorry i am working on is called hifi or hybrid finance so mm-hmm. what we are saying is we want to bridge the centralized world of today and the decentralized world of today we want to join them so we want to bring the best of both together so what a hybrid finance blockchain is it's a public blockchain but full kyc full anti money laundering full consumer support and anti money laundering all these kind of checks built in so i believe the future belongs to hybrid finance and as of right now the biggest success in that is the algorand project i mean mm-hmm. algorand is also a permissioned public blockchain 
where even mm-hmm. though it is public by nature it has permission so if someone tries to commit a fraud you can actually lock or quarantine the assets and then there is a dispute resolution committee which decides and then the asset can be moved and that's what happens in the centralized world if someone commits a crime you have banks which can freeze your account if the court orders them so i believe we are going to see a lot of the movement now coming towards hybrid finance where you have the best of both world and then almost every use case that you can visualize would start happening on there any question my question would be how the existing banks with align to the such rapid movement that is my uh well that's a very good question so well every organization has to react i mean if you look at what happened with blackberry and nokia they were at the peak and suddenly within like a very short span they went bankrupt because their industry moved so fast now every industry needs to realize that things work fast today so you have to figure out what is the latest and then you have to move in that direction i am sure banks are already thinking in that direction when they are seeing the nbfcs today or the startups i mean you look at the payment industry right today the payment industry which is like one of the biggest payment players like what do you guys use for sending money around the country today i'm using google pay you're using google pay can anyone else tell me is anyone else using say a bank system or you're using google pay or things like that can i say that most of us are probably using paytms or google pays or these bharat pay phone pay and all that yeah. yes now do you realize how that system has changed can you imagine 10 years ago if i told you this that a day will come very soon when banks will not be part of the payment system nobody would have believed me right but it's happened these changes are coming so every organization needs to react fast clear any questions on this okay then uh, we have metaverses so first let me just explain that there's a lot of hype around metaverse right and metaverse is not ready as in today's metaverse is at a very crude and preliminary level but the direction is brilliant so i used to use the metaverse somewhere in the early 2000s when i used to use a platform called second life and there there were rock shows also held there and lots of very interactive things and i'm talking about the early 2000s about 15 16 years ago now the vision of metaverse is a digital universe so today instead of traveling to a country like simple example i'll give you is the capital of south korea seoul they are planning to make entire seoul in the metaverse which means today if i want to visit there i have to apply for a visa travel to the airport take a flight there so many frictions coming so much cost comes in now imagine i could wear this goggle i mean today it is slightly clunky and expensive but so will it be just like my specs and sitting at home in a minute or in a second i am in south korea and i can move around there i can wear haptic gloves shake hands with people and actually feel that i can even soon i'll be able to get the smells of the place and i will feel that i am in the country without actually being there now that is the kind of things that the metaverse is going to bring us we will be able to visit other planets we will be able to visit museums in some other part of the world all while staying at home that's the ultimate vision of the metaverse is that part clear any questions on that mm, you know it is clear um, rose i had i had that question it is more of a technical so take example in metaverse i have built that adventure land Mm-hmm. and one of the part is like okay if someone one of the users would go into that particular land they need to pay few extra crypto now i know that most of the world right now they are using either that decentral land that means unity or unreal engine to build that part so if because when go, someone goes into that room they need to pay extra crypto so how that linking between that front end part to the blockchain because when clicks on crypto that means smart contract needs to be executed according to that they need to charge x amount of crypto sure. so how that linking would happen between the front end to that blockchain back end it is all api driven and is it like decentralized land or something is providing that api oh, or someone needs to build okay. or so, someone needs to build that middleware interface this is what my very good question is. so what we've got to remember is one is the platform and one is the blockchain now yeah. the metaverse platform needs to connect to multiple technology platforms right they will yeah. allow normal credit card payment also it's not like they will force you to only use crypto right so yeah. each blockchain already has its api services 
So whether it's Ethereum or Binance, all of them have API services. You can directly connect to them or then you can use third parties like Infura, which does provides you an infrastructure service for APIs. So ultimately it is all going to be API. API actually, this, is, this is the actual confusion uh, to the normal people, even the technical people also that metaverse is because of the blockchain. No, no, Why these are a... separate things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Two other... very different. Blockchain, thing. where blockchain comes into the metaverse is the NFT. So what happens, I'll give you an example. Right now I'm sitting in my house. Can you see this wallpaper behind me? Now this yes. is a real wall with a real wallpaper. I had to pay for the wallpaper. Mm -hmm. Now, if I make a home in the metaverse, I will want a wallpaper there also. How will I get it? Right? I cannot carry an image there because that file format, JPG is not supported. My JPG cannot mm -hmm. become a wallpaper. So I have to then buy a wallpaper as an NFT. That requires the blockchain because NFTs are created on blockchain. I can take that into the metaverse, put it on my wall, later sell it to someone else if I want. Right. So blockchain has a role to play because of the NFT piece. Other than that, metaverses involve so many different technologies, AR, VR, and so many other yeah. things come in. Blockchain provides one part. Uh, no, but and AR, VR, and sorry, big tech, that what they the extended technology, they all are front end. But I believe the economics part, which is the main part to build something ideally, that could be done mostly via blockchain because it is decentralized and it is transparent. That's the reason why people are believing right now in this technology. Is this correct to say? Because it without, it, uh, yeah. I would say decentralization is not the important thing here. Because if I be honest with you, I mean, I've written a post on this in detail. If you look at the top cryptos, they are actually not decentralized at all. It's a myth. Of course, I'll share that article with you later. You can read that. So I think the real important thing in a blockchain is more about the immutability. The fact that, you know, I don't need to say, suppose, you know, I'm in India, you are in Japan, someone else is in a third country and the metaverse is run by a company in another country. How are they going to take payments? Which currency are we going to use? Now, as an Indian, you want me to use US dollar every time I'm losing on conversion so many times. So the beauty of crypto is irrespective of which part of the world you are in, you're all able to hold crypto with zero friction. So that crypto piece, which is because of the technology, because of that immutability is critical. Whether a particular crypto is highly decentralized or not, honestly, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But crypto makes it easy to do these payments. UPI is brilliant in India. What is crypto? Effectively like UPI for the world, where you have one address and you can accept crypto from anyone anywhere in the world. Isn't that very similar to what UPI does? You have one address and you can transfer money to someone in seconds. Consider crypto to be like UPI for the world. I hope it's clear what I'm trying to explain. Here also, but here, here is a point. Like you just, uh, just gave an example of a different country. There will be a different metaverse providers, I would say. See, because metaverse I is don't think so. I think the metaverse will be ruled by one is, of course, Facebook's. Another mm -hmm. one will be Google's. Another one mm -hmm. will be the Roblox and those Microsoft. I think mm -hmm. we'll probably only see four or five and very soon. Because if you look at social media also, at one time, there used to be so many platforms, right? Mm -hmm. But today you realize most of them are shut down. It is very few platforms which remain because you look at any industry in the world. I mean, you look at cola drinks. We do not have 100 companies selling us cola drinks in India, for example. Ultimately, mm -hmm. most of the market is controlled by Coke, Pepsi. Similarly, I believe in the metaverse. Initially, there will be multiple players. But at the end of the day, there'll be just two or three left. Which is why I'm not in favor of people spending so much on virtual land today. Because how do you even know that decentralized land is going to last for so many years? Right? So I believe, uh, and I would bet big on Facebook for this, because they actually have probably played the social game the best so far. And Metaverse is just another extension of that. I would say that they would probably be the final success. Mm -hmm. So in this case, Rose, take an example what they are trying to do. They are trying to build the entire real world into the virtual world, right? That's this true. is what Metaverse is all Then whenever they make a registration, so take an example, if my house would be in that Metaverse world and someone would come and watch it, that means if Facebook would own that particular part, then no one else should be able to own it, right? Because you can't have more than one NFT if you make a token or make you make an ID it should remain a unique across the globe. Then only it would make sense. But that's so is it like platform. that? See, today on yeah. Facebook also, if you have a username, 
nobody else can have that same username on facebook but they can have the same username on linkedin right uh, so mm-hmm. in the future if there are multiple metaverses each of them can be as big as they want see in the real world we are limited by the amount of land now elon musk is trying to take us to mars but that will still take decades in the metaverse there is no restriction the metaverse need not be the size of planet earth it can be the size of the universe you can actually have as much land as you want you can create there which is why it is not a sensible idea to buy virtual land because there is no limit mm, in okay. in the real world if you go to a city like bombay you know that there is limited land once in a while the government puts mud into the sea and reclaims it but that's a very expensive process so we know that physical land is limited virtual land is unlimited oh i thought i thought whoever is going to make a us a virtual country that means they will first of all try to get the rights that we are going to create this part that means no one else i am taking oh, as a copyright kind of thing like, so that like that. nothing but, like that yeah okay then there would be like same one yeah. a- address for my home would have been, have been given that abc address similar one would give me give another address in their metaverse and right. after that depending on their quality and resolution and graphics they are going to charge right this is how right. it's going to work right. oh, okay okay i thought they were trying to control by just registering those so, ip under their name so that no one can no one else can make that virtualization for that particular part no, it is not going to happen like that no, right? not gonna happen. okay hmm. any other questions so, uh, so if i want to buy a property using meta so in that case also meta will hold my uh, data right on metaverse they are going to get huge amounts of data they are going to get i mean exponentially more data now about us because everything that we do which direction we look in so i mean i'll give you a very simple example they will realize that i as an individual always look at the left when i'm walking on a road so that means when i go into the road and they want to show me an ad they will not show it on the right of the road they will show on the left today they don't have that data nobody in the world has that data because nobody is mapping me individually soon all of us will be mapped and how we move work talk everything will now be known by them so the amount of data they will gather will be 100000 times more and they will hold that data okay. okay okay then another very important aspect is non fungible tokens so on the one hand you have fungible tokens like say bitcoin so you have 21 million of a particular crypto non fungible is where you are talking about slightly unique things like whether it's a piece of art or whether it is a uh, you know collectible item all of these is what we call as nfts now i'll be very honest i have not been a very big fan of digital art nfts because they don't make sense to me. see i mean you can take like i look at the wallpaper behind me because it is printed on a piece of paper it has a cost but if i take a photo of this a high resolution photo and i put it on the internet thousand people can download it it doesn't really make much sense to me which is why i believe only those nfts which have intellectual property with it like i'll give you an example when my children were small they wanted the water bottle for their school or the school bag to have dora on it you know have you heard of dora that dora the explorer if you have children you would have heard of that yeah. cartoon creature yeah yeah, yeah yes. absolutely right. yes yes then they grow a little more they want disney so disney cartoons then they grow older they want avengers right so what is it actually here these characters have gotten and developed a fan following but they are controlled they are licensed and there is a commercial license with it so when the people who make dora tie up with a bag manufacturer the bag manufacturer pays them and they give intellectual property rights saying you can use dora now unless an nft carries an intellectual property right it is of no use it is just another image which anybody in the world can copy how are you going to commercially monetize and you can see the classic example the world's first tweet it was sold as an nft for 2.7 million dollars a year or two ago that guy now tried to resell it and he is not even getting thousands of dollars for it because it is not giving me any commercial benefit to own it so i believe only if an nft has some kind of either intellectual property attached or it has a collectible value like there is a postage stamp physical issued by a country a collector like me gets it and along with it we have a qr code to access the nft version of it okay it's connected to that real world thing plain digital art nfts or plain tweets i don't think they are good investments personal opinion anyone wants to add anything on that 
Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, Gagan, would you like to go? Then you may go first. Hello. No, no, go ahead, Gunjan. <laughs> my yeah. my kid is fine. No, no. Okay, Rose. Then how about if we link that digital to the physical things? So take an example. Someone is a nice painter. He or she paints the thing. After that, yes, it's easy to sell it via NFT so that it's visible. It would get the more market. But after that. once someone would buy it we will send a physical painting to them and after that also he can sell it further then that, that also, model would also. make sense it does yeah. because you are giving okay. physical art right physical art at last yeah. but it's we are using this as a model so that it can be spread to the multiple people but at the same time whoever created that original painting although it would go to now 10 different ads that the original painter would get the some amount of money based on the smart contract whatever has been specified That, that would be a perfect model right yes okay. so you know if we use nft for example to authenticate the art that okay you mm. know if you have this painting how do you know it's real and it's not a fake so you have an nft linked to it linked and that shows it. your name as the owner because today in art there is no registry right yeah. when you buy a car the rto has the data of who is the latest owner of the car if mm. you sell it to someone else that person's name is entered there but in art there is nothing so yeah neither is the price discovery transparent nor is the ownership transparent but when you connect nfts to physical art you can solve both these problems so that's a good use case yeah sure sure no thank you and because i think i attended uh, one of the i am in london so i attended one of the webinar uh, not actual physical seminar in london that guy who has created an nft for some of the london and california based property and what he said i said obviously you created it and he said that he has registered with the particular government as well for those token id so that the ultimate goal was to sell the property online at the same time he said that one of the square foot or some square foot of the house can be rented that is tokenization of real estate yeah so this is, is that is my that is my next use case Oh, okay okay I'm just so going I to try talk about it. I try to read your mind in advance then sorry then we'll discuss <laughs> yeah, yeah i just actually I, i i also just wanted to chip in just because of this point because nft because of the hype it is directly concentrating on the art and digital thing but it is actual the tokenization of tokenization and you're absolutely right so the last point that i want to talk about is the concept of a wrapped asset or a tokenized asset so what that means is like today when we want to buy real estate we have to put lot of money and a huge amount of risk we have to take if there is a litigation everything is a pain now imagine you tokenize it so you take an entire building in dubai and then you tokenize it into 11 mill 1 mm nfts let's not call them nfts let's just call them tokens and then people can invest fractions like today in the mutual fund world because of things like sip systematic investment plan you can invest 1000 rupees a month into a mutual fund with that 1000 you may not even be able to buy one share of a big company but because you are part of this mutual fund you can buy tiny amounts now extend that concept to virtually any asset so already in the world we are beginning to see tokens backed by real estate we are seeing it backed by gold we are seeing it backed by agricultural products like coffee tea and wheat so in brazil we have coffee coin each coffee coin is backed by 1 kg of coffee there is a custodian who is regularly giving proof a trusted custodian third party who gives proof how much of coffee is actually held in those warehouses which is backing that coin or you look at the example of paxos which has started for gold so they are actually holding physical gold they are giving you custody proof you can even go and physically verify that so we have i am beginning to see tokenization of physical assets really starting to pick up because it gives a lot of value you can buy parts of assets for tiny amounts of money which today otherwise you cannot do so if i believe in dubai real estate is a good investment today i can't participate but tomorrow with even a 1000 rupees i can participate in that investment opportunity hope that part's clear yeah rose but uh, actually i was also looking on the tokenization field and researching things what i felt is yeah i just you mentioned that somebody some custodian is maintaining the authenticity of the tokenized asset so it is just like a mapping of some token to actual value whether it is it is a correct mapping or not i would say 
so these are the mappers now if everything every assets is physical asset is going to be tokenized there should be some kind of custodians for every category of assets for which everyone need to rely on so it will be like in a digital world we are relying on google facebook and other people now in a tokenized world we will be relying on some certified custodians right absolutely correct and, and i'll give you an example yeah sure go ahead if you look at the example today when a company raises money through debentures so what do they do it's a secured debenture so their physical property of the company is actually handed over as in the ownership documents and all to a debenture trustee Mm -hmm. who is a sebi authorized entity and he is the one who says yes this much of the asset is with my control tomorrow if the debenture holder is not paid on time principal or interest the debenture trustee can sell the property and pay the person so mm -hmm. we already have such entities in place custodians in place now, now they just need to add a new business model right today they are doing it for companies raising debentures tomorrow they could do it for any kind of tokenizing such custodians already exist but their businesses will now really boom once we bring in tokenization so my uh, actual point was rohas a uh, normal user need to rely on some custodian yes how can the trust be built with the custodian and the sure. end user sure take an example of usdt tether right mm -hmm. tether is a stable coin issuer we give them money they it it is put into their bank account and they give us usdt i'm sure all of you have heard of tether yes yes, yes. how do why do we trust them Think Because about it. It's backed by a stable coin. So, but the sorry, point is, currency. but the point is, how do you know that Tether is actually holding that much currency? Exactly. Yeah. So they have built that. We we don't know, but we we trust the audit. Uh, exactly, that. exactly. So we, in fact, ninety nine percent people don't even bother to check. But you can mm. go to the Tether website, and you can check there. They show you their audit statements from their chartered accountant. They mm -hmm. show you their bank statements. and if you want you can check that but again there is an element of trust involved that those are genuine documents so it's the same case here with any token if a custodian is able to prove to you that he is a reliable person because he's been doing business for x number of years well we trust him and then the beauty of the digital world is the custodian can always put photographs on social media you know where the physical location is if you are investing huge amounts of money you can also go and check but trust is always required so this is where in the bitcoin world for example you are not supposed to trust people you are only yes. supposed to trust technology right yes. but in the wrapped asset or the tokenized asset world we are going back to trusting people because that's just the way it is because the value is not on chain the value is off chain off chain right yeah so in bitcoin the value is on chain because it is those tokens and the technology is what we trust but in wrapped assets the value is off chain whether it's coffee tea wheat sugar us dollars or gold the value is off chain and that is why we need third party custodians and and that is the reason was uh, i was very much you know not confused but i think with all this technological evolution everything what we are happening in web3 world and we see and we saying that it will happen in future ultimately we circling back to the same people same central or some of the central authority to trust which currently we are saying that these are the evil people which i actually <laughs> concluded in this manner <laughs> actually i think it is wrong to call them evil because come on think about it yaar banks employ lakhs of people like you and me right yeah. so they are not really evil i mean that is just a uh, you know the initial bitcoin fans they created this narrative created, yes. that everything done by the government is come on that's yeah. not true Mm. i mean it is the government which is making the country progress right so i think that's an unfair thing but you're right yes. you're absolutely right we're heading back to that because we <laughs> ultimately have to trust people yeah that's how the world works yeah any other question i'll then move to the last point which is creator economy that i think is the most important part and that started out which is that you know you look at today's industry today creators have become very very important so whether it is a youtube influencer whether it is an author filmmaker musician these are critical to our lives today now what web 3.0 is trying to do for them is allowing them to raise funds from their fans right so today always i'll give you my own example so i have been an author all my life i have published multiple books only once i went with an external publisher and i realized i did not earn even 5% of the printed price of the book as a royalty 
but when i do self publishing and i create my own distribution channel i am able to keep all the money for myself now imagine a filmmaker a musician who has fans and they want to make a new movie or a new mu music album they will reach out to their fans saying on the blockchain or on the crypto platform contribute this much money because that's what i need i will then make the content movie film whatever and i will give you part ownership so if you have invested 1% in my project 1% of the copyright is yours so whatever money we make 1% is yours and imagine if this was available to us many years ago when shole was made and we could be a 1% owner of a movie like shole we would earn money for decades and that is the kind of opportunity which the creator economy is giving us it is allowing content creators to reach out to fans raise money from their fans and distribute profit back to the fans and i think that is one of the best use cases especially as a content creator i feel that is the number one thing that web3 is doing for us does anyone have any point of view on that no you rightly mentioned oh, this is the actual thing <laughs> the creator and the sharing of the revenue and the profit and incentivizing which is the actual uh, you can say uh, the green area green posture which people are following the web3 thing apart from this the conceptual thing decentralization and other things uh, the getting value of your work back to you in a fair equitable manner is the prime point which i can see here absolutely because if you look at the publishing network today they keep a huge chunk of the profits now imagine if that chunk of the profits is split between the creator and the fan and the consumer you don't need to pay that third party entity anymore and today anyway all creators are creating their own communities so why do they even need the distribution yeah. channel of a publisher and that even, i think even, is going to completely disrupt not the prof profit uh, uh, it is just about the cartelization also they hold a grip on the particular industry or particular area of the adventure which they won't allow anybody else or new person to come into the picture Absolutely. this is the this is actually revolutionizing this web3 revolution in this area anybody can contribute create and become rich basically absolutely i totally agree so that is something which i am also extremely uh, you know bullish about this particular yes. use case and uh, someone just posted a couple of questions so let me just answer them so someone's asked about how long upi will be so heavily subsidized well to be very honest it can be subsidized forever because i will be very honest there is not so much of cost in running that platform See, because when we are using technology, you look at it today. Gmail. What is the actual cost incurred by Gmail when I click a button and send you an email? That is actually much more than the cost incurred in running a payment network. Because in Gmail's case, I could be uploading GBs of data. So much of bandwidth and storage space gets consumed. But Google has been able to keep email free for us for decades now. So I believe UPI could continue to remain subsidized. And anyway, in the future, we are probably just going to have CBDCs. so upi probably won't even exist and it would all become part of the cbdc project and another person asked is how many years do we see this future happening well to be very honest it's already started right we are already seeing a lot of the use cases of web3 which have become a reality the bat project basic attention token is hugely successful and it's several years old now i have dozens of such projects i have analyzed which are doing very well so i think this is already here and it is just going to keep increasing hope that answers your question yeah. does anyone else have any questions i, I actually uh, uh, here is the point uh, rohit uh, with this question uh, it is happening as of now but if we see the technical infrastructure it is very broken i mean you need to get the wallet you need to site you need to connect the things now i cannot buy ether and other things crypto coins to pay back to some application here so this is still a broken thing now whatever is being currently pushed out as a as a hype i would say but in undercurrent are actual use cases being built but the question which the user has asked is the same which everyone is asking when it will be the mainstream with which is we use the web to technologies sure so I, i would say it's very difficult to give a time prediction but every day technologies are getting better Yeah. So it's just a gradual thing. Every day. I mean, if you look back, if you remember initially the first browser in the world, I don't know if any of you ever remember using it. It was horrible in comparison to what a Google Chrome today is. Yeah. yeah And I remember email. We used to get five MB free space. 
and then yeah. gmail came and said 1 gb it was unbelievable we thought it's a joke it's an april fool joke because how can you give 1 gb when everyone is giving 5 mb but yeah. that's what i'm saying so it'll happen it'll keep happening every day new things are coming in and new technologies are making things better today yes crypto is a little difficult to use but come on for the ordinary people even upi is difficult to use you know try yes. to explain to someone who's not at all tech savvy and upi is not easy for them at all so similarly you know there has to be that education users getting comfortable with it technology is constantly improving so i am extremely bullish on web Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, uh, Rohan, uh, this is Pravi here. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question on the regulatory framework which is coming up in India. So, what do you think? Because right now, most of the founders who are based out of Web three are moving to like tax havens like uh, Singapore or else to like something like that. Okay. So, what do you think the future is? Because right now, the government itself has supposed to give like a thirty percent of tax, right? Uh, just for the crypto people. So, how is it going to play out? Sure, sure. so actually i think the main problem is not the 30% tax i think the bigger problem is going to be the 1% tds because what is going to happen because of that is the traders who are doing huge volume of trading imagine if at every time you do a trade and 1% is getting cut as tds even though at the end of the year you may get it back from the government your entire capital will get stuck to give you a simple example if you are a trader with 1 lakh rupees you are every day going to make deals of 10 lakh rupees because you're going to take collateral now imagine when i do a 10 lakh rupee buy or a 10 lakh rupee sell i am getting 1% deducted as tds and within a month my entire capital will be stuck into tds so that i believe is a far bigger problem and because of that a lot of people are starting to use foreign exchanges rather than indian exchanges some of the larger players are beginning to move to countries like dubai which is you know very open to and calling the crypto industry there and definitely i do see that brain drain happening however if your project is web 3 but doesn't involve crypto then there is absolutely no problem so the indian government is extremely bullish on blockchain but not bullish on crypto so if you look you know we are the only country in the world where every year the government publishes the blockchain strategy report and in this year's report also they have identified a lot of use cases all around blockchain which the government is very positive on. but crypto is something they are not positive on because of so many of the problems which are very difficult to solve Whether it is money laundering, whether it is frauds and scams, so the government has taken a different approach. Uh, but inherently, any of the DUS which comes into picture, right? Those are in any way going to be crypto projects, right? Uh, I couldn't get you. Could you say that again? So any of the DAOs or anything like that, right? They are actually basically depending upon the tokens which are in the crypto, right? So uh, that's a very good point. But that can change. So today, if you realize, like that's exactly again the work, the area I'm working in, where we are saying we have the hybrid finance blockchain. we are giving full kyc it is not a crypto right so slowly you will see a lot of projects moving into that direction where you will not need publicly traded cryptos you will be using there so let me give you an example have you heard of the concept of a prepaid instrument or mm-hmm. maybe if you have heard things like that uh, you know food coupons i forget the name of the company uh, sodexo sodexo yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah so when you look at sodexo was sodexo like a crypto no but it was like a prepaid instrument where as a company you paid sodexo they give you a bunch of passes you can go and redeem those passes in restaurants so i would say that is the ideal approach where you could even register your project as a prepaid instrument people pay you in advance you give them your token they use that token to buy and sell within your ecosystem which could be a dao which could be any web3 project but the government will not call it a crypto so i think we are heading in that direction Yeah, good to know. Thank you. Hi, Rohan. May I ask a question? Sure, sure. Right. So, uh, with regards to this PPI, there's uh, there's two kinds, right? Open and closed. And uh, in order to get a closed PPI license, is close to impossible for small startups and businesses. So, what you're going to have? Uh, sorry, I mean open. What we're going to have is a, a closed PPI license. And uh, in term, I mean, uh, if you read the crypto tax policy. they keep using the term digital assets and, virtual and digital assets here is virtual, virtual digital assets and my fear is that each time we uh, exchange these tokens uh, for what the purpose is if that exceeds a certain value say 10k uh, they are going to impose that 30% uh, uh, tax deduction right excellent no if it is coming so suppose you are doing this under a prepaid instrument license of rbi you will not come yeah. under this tax 
I am hundred percent sure. Yeah. Okay. So what what we've got to remember is the definition of BDA is there in the Income Tax Act now. So when we examine that definition in depth, what it actually covers is all crypto assets of today. So whether it's a Bitcoin, Solana, BAT, NFT, all of them are covered. But loyalty points don't come under that. Because logically, we could say even a loyalty point is just like that. But no, they don't get covered. Similarly, when you have these specific licenses from the RBI, you will not come under the definition of a BDA. And so plus, a lot of new laws, plus a lot of new laws will be coming in. We have regulatory sandboxes which are being established by the government. We've already seen multiple cohorts of those across the regulators. So all this is going to make our life much easier. And it will allow us to do a lot of Web3 businesses, but not crypto. Because uh, we are a budding startup. Uh, we use the BSP blockchain. And we would like to build various uh, solutions starting from our BSP wallet. So our biggest fear is uh, this crypto tax. I mean, we, are, we do not support crypto trading just for the heck of it. But in order to promote real use cases, you would want the user to uh, load up, you know, top up. And if, if that's where the government comes into play and uh, <laughs> plays spoil sport, that's, uh, that's so a big fear for I, us. I would recommend that it is very important for you to get good legal team in place which can then have initiate dialogue. See, because the tax departments are very open. You can ask them questions. So have a chat with the income tax department as the, and the GST department. And I'm sure they'll be able to guide you and they will be able to tell you whether what you're doing comes under VDA or not. Okay. okay. So get a good Thank legal you. team. Yeah. Thank you. That was very helpful. Sure. Any other questions? So great. It was... It was really I nice do have talking. a question. Yeah, sure. Please tell me. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stefano from, uh, from, from Italy. And thank you very much, Roas, for, uh, for this meeting. It's really precious. Uh, so basically, uh, with other colleagues, we are building up a, a decentralized uh, venture capital, uh, starting from a community. Uh, so uh, we have uh, set up um, a Discord. We have uh, our initial... Uh, Early adopters, uh, they are uh, more or less 400 uh, people, um, professional investors and, and technicians. And now uh, the, the parts came uh, harder uh, because um, right now we need to decide the, the final strategy. Uh, of course, we need to, to, to collect money from the crowd, uh, but in the other side, uh, we do not uh, go in in a um, chain that we are not sure about or uh, we are not uh, uh, putting our uh, token or our non-fungible token outside of the uh, platform because we are not sure about that. And my question is, uh, from your opinion, um, what would be a, a good strategy for um, uh, for project like uh, us, like, um, we need to go uh, to the crowd, uh, but we don't have the, um, the perfect strategy or the, a good strategy to do that. Uh, how we can uh, approach this problem? Sure. So your question is complex and it would, I would need to think and give you a proper answer. So I have also announced a cohort of startups which are at a very early stage. And if you're working in the blockchain or crypto space, I'm mm -hmm. mentoring a lot of startups. So uh, you have time till the end of this month to apply for it. There's no fees. And uh, then yes. can, can you give me, uh, please, the, the link for, for just the... Go to, just go to LinkedIn. Connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a direct message. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very just much. Just tell me about your project. Just a few lines and I'll put you as part of the cohort. Thank you very much. And by Thank the way, that's much. open to everyone else also on the chat. You uh, Till 30th of April, applications are open. So if you are at an early stage with any Web3 blockchain crypto project, get in touch with me and I'll guide you guys. And don't worry, I don't take anything in return. It's pure mentoring. Thank you very much. Awesome. It's really appreciating. Sure. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. So Thank great. you very much. Most welcome. And I do this, I'll be doing these sessions every Friday at 4 p.m. same time. So I hope to see you guys next week again. Yeah, yeah bye -bye. thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks.